Good morning everyone. Kia ora. I'm Tara Pond and I'm doing my honours in psychology and today I'm going to talk to you about my dissertation. The topic, as you can see behind me, is the experiences of bisexual women who use Tinder. Before I talk about my research, I'll give you some background. The internet is now a crucial part of everyday life. It affects every facet of society and dominates our culture. As of 2012, two thirds of New Zealanders were online. The majority of those were aged 15 to 34, with approximately 93% of us using the internet. People connect to the internet in all sorts of different places, home, work, school, at libraries, cafes, on the street. There are also numerous ways to connect, the laptop, desktop computer, smartphone, tablet, TV, gaming machine. It's not surprising then that a crucial need in our society, finding a romantic partner, is now integrated online. Online dating sites were launched in the 1990s, at the beginning of the World Wide Web, and, we de and were developed into what is now a billion dollar industry. Online dating is defined as a web-based service where people access potential romantic and sexual partners, match with compatible partners and communicate with them. While online dating is clearly popular, it has been stigmatised. Typically, meeting partners online was associated with the socially awkward, those users who couldn't get a date elsewhere, and lonely people over 40. Those under 25, the highest users of the internet, were the least likely to try to find their romantic partners online. This has been attributed to the negative perception of online dating. Fear surrounding perceived dangers of the internet also increased the stigmatisation of online dating. With concern about being deceived by unknown, dangerous strangers, a common narrative around internet use. But as these myths were disproved, online dating rose in popularity as a method for meeting potential partners. However, online dating remains most common among those who face thin dating markets, those who have a reduced selection of the dating pool, such as older adults and people who don't identify as heterosexual. Online dating has since evolved into mobile dating, with the rise of smartphones. Mobile dating differs from online dating as it uses a location-based, real-time design. This dating application can access your location using GPS, then suggests nearby users for you to contact. This allows greater efficiency than online dating, as you do not need to manually screen out individuals that you deem too far away to contact, as you can match in real time. This feature eliminates the need for users to spend weeks or months talking to potential dates online before meeting in person, as mobile dating sites promote potential partners who live near you. These apps are greatly simplified in comparison to online dating services where you are matched based on algorithms or questions that quantify how romantically compatible you are with potential partners. Tinder is one of the most popular apps globally and the most downloaded dating app in 18 countries, including New Zealand. It has around 50 million active users. The majority of those users are under 25 years old, so the average age are significantly lower than online dating services. This has been attributed to the high rate of smartphone users under 30 years old. And more commonly, the appeal is in what is called the gamification of dating, which appeals to a younger audience. For example, Tinder has the characteristics of an addictive game that can be used socially with friends. The fun is in deciding who you want to swipe left or right on. Tinder works by retrieving the user's GPS location and finding people with Tinder accounts within your chosen distance. The user can then see the profiles of other people that fit their chosen parameters, such as age, gender and geographic location. The app automatically defaults to heterosexual, but you can change the option to view males, females or both. If the user decides that they are not interested in the person that has been suggested by Tinder, they swipe left to discard. Alternatively, if a user decides that they are interested in someone that has been suggested by the site, they swipe right to accept. Tinder has introduced the double opt-in feature to mobile dating, but users must swipe right on each other in order to begin an online conversation. To set up Tinder, the user creates an account by linking Tinder to their Facebook account, so the app can store the name, age, friends, likes, and other information, such as the school they attend and place of work. The quick, easy and simple setup of the app is appealing, particularly to young people, because filling out personal details will take less than a minute. This takes significantly less time than other online dating sites, where you fill out numerous personal details and information about yourself before you can proceed to look at other people's profiles. 
Another appealing characteristic of Tinder is that it eliminates rejection from dating and therefore leads to less personal risk than dating offline as you can avoid the embarrassment of a negative response. The user swipes left anonymously so potential partners are unaware that a rejection has taken place. Having access to chat with only people you swipe right on is appealing as unlike online dating sites where anyone can message you, you do not, need, you do not get any unsolicited messages. Because of this feature, Tinder advertises itself as female friendly and empowering. Something that has been contradicted by merely doing a Google search for female friendly Tinder and seeing the numerous articles offering Tinder alternates that are more suited for women. The main critique is that women are still harassed, send unsolicited sexual requests and photos. Name the first paper to quantify the use of Tinder by gender, Tyson and his colleagues in 2016 asserted that men get very little matches what they dramatically call a starvation of matches, in comparison to women, and theorise this is due to a feedback loop, where women are driven to be selective as they know that they have a high likelihood of attaining a match. Due to the overwhelming amount of anecdotal evidence from media outlets, I posturise that this may be due to the misogyny that comes with matching with some men, and so women are cautious. Mobile dating is a new concept, and so research on the topic is severely lacking. However, a great deal of media coverage has been focused on Tinder and other dating apps. Mainstream media, when discussing Tinder, has focused predominantly on security as having been brand risky for women to meet up with men that have been matched to due to reported incidences of women being raped and mugged while meeting up with Tinder matches. Men also have crimes committed against them when, against, with people that they meet on Tinder, but this is not part of the media's narrative. I'll now look at the population I'm concerned with, bisexual women. Bisexuality is defined as the attraction to more than one gender. Those who identify as bisexual struggle greatly, yet they feel like they do not belong in heteronormative mainstream society and are alienated from the gay community. Invisibility of the bisexual sexual orientation permeates all areas of society and leads to harmful effects for bi bisexual identified people with higher rates of anxiety and depression than any other sexual minority sexual identity. In addition, bisexual women are disproportionately sexually assaulted, with around 61% of bisexual women are raped, sexually assaulted or physically harmed by an intimate partner. Within the Journal of Bisexuality and other journals that include papers involving bisexual populations, there is a lack of discussion on the dating lives of bisexual people or their experiences of dating. Looking more broadly, there is research on non-heterosexual dating lives as they differ greatly from heterosexual populations. The internet has been used by people who identify as sexual minorities since the beginning of the World Wide Web. This is predominantly because of the safety it affords them in comparison to the offline world. LGB people are much more likely to spend time online using social network sites in comparison to people who identify as heterosexual. This can be attributed to the benefit it affords them in contrast to socialising offline where there is fear of discrimination and alienation. The internet allows people to be anonymous, which can be liberating to those who are stigmatised offline, and so they can explore their sexuality without fear of persecution. When it comes to dating, LGB people, individuals, run into many social problems, such as living in sparsely populated or rural areas severely decreases the likelihood of finding a partner who identifies as non-heterosexual. Outside of explicitly identified gay locations, approaching an individual to find out whether they're LGB could be embarrassing or potentially dangerous. Online dating sites overcome these obstacles as geographic location is not an issue in online spaces. People are able to explicitly state their identity. It therefore removes the barriers of finding people within the community, allowing access to a great deal more LGB people than they would be able to meet offline. Online dating sites also promise discretion and privacy, which can be very important to LGB people and their stigmatised identities. And it's because of these advantages that same-sex couples are more likely to meet through the internet than heterosexual people, and they're more likely to meet online than in any other situation. Mobile dating apps decrease the danger and the stigma of people wanting same-sex sexual partners while enabling LGB people to access numerous potential dates at once, a feat that was only available for heterosexuals in day-to-day -day life. No studies have yet looked at the internet, online dating or mobile dating behaviours solely of people who identify as bisexual, which brings us to my current research. 
The methodology in which my research is situated is a qualitative exploratory approach and is informed by a critical feminist framework. By using this framework, the city's intention is to go beyond examining people's social reality to empowering marginalised people towards change. This framework is underpinned by the assumption that society is unequal for people who are within certain social categories due to the patriarchal structure of our society. The epistemological perspective taken is critical realism, which asserts that knowledge is socially influenced, but there are real truths we can only partially access. This informs our understanding of the participants' experiences is what they experience acknowledged to be the reality, but it's also influenced by identifiable social structures. The participants were recruited through posters put up around the AUT North Shore campus and also posted to various New Zealand LGBTQ groups on Facebook. Women who identified as bisexual, were aged between 18 to 25 and had used Tinder, were encouraged to email me. A time was set up for an interview which took place at either the North Shore or the city AUT campus. I recruited five participants and conducted semi-structured interviews with each of them that ranged in length from 35 to 65 minutes. While the participants all largely identified as bisexual, it was not always the only sexual orientation they identified with, as can be common within the LGBTQ community, as displayed in the table behind me. The interviews covered questions about the woman's experiences of using Tinder, dating and their sexuality. But as the interviews were semi-structured, they did not rigidly adhere to specific wording or order. Semi-structured interviews gave flexibility to the interviews, giving participants an opportunity to bring up new ideas. A deeper understanding of the participants' experiences was created through the structure. The interviews were audio recorded and transcribed verbatim, leading to pages of data to analyse. The research is currently in its data analysis stage. The metric analysis is being used to analyse the data. The metric analysis identifies, analyzes and reports themes across the data and the flexibility of this tool fits well within the epistemological and methodological stance of this research. While the research is still in the analysis stage, patterns have begun to emerge that are in line with previous findings. My research will fill a large gap within online dating research, as studies about Tinder are now only beginning to emerge, and my study will allow us to hear about the app directly from the people who use it. It will also give a voice to the marginalised and often invalidated group of people, bisexual women, where they have the opportunity to talk about the area of their lives that causes the most controversy, dating. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Yes. Can you say something about the difference between pansexual, polysexual, and bisexual? Absolutely. So bisexual is defined in different ways by different people. So the bisexual community says it's being attracted to more than one gender, but mainstream society says it's being attracted to two, two genders. Um, polysexual is being attracted to more than one gender, as it's a umbrella term for terms like queer, pansexual and bisexual. Um, and then pansexual is being attracted to different genders. Uh, they're all very similar sounding, but which is why people can identify as more than one. Hi. Hi. Um, this is an area of great interest to me, especially because I've just been up with my mother. Um, I'm very interested to hear with uses of Tinder, with the people that you talk to, did they focus more on the positive or negative, or did you just get a bit of a in the middle? It depended on what area we were talking about. Um, when it comes to safety, a lot of people were quite nervous about sort of deception, um, but then a lot of people talked about the positives in that it's way easier to find queer people online than offline. So, yeah. Hi. I ask another question. Yeah, go for it. So, so I'm interested in your age group, what mm -hmm. sort of Um, well, it depends, of course, on the type of people you're talking to, because I know a lot of queer people, obviously, it's my research, so a lot of them are quite positive towards the area. And in general, I would say that people in my age group are 
very open to this sort of thing. And in fact, a lot of them think that bisexuality is the most common sexuality and that people will sit somewhere on the scale from homosexual, heterosexual, with more around the middle. Hi. Yes, I did have some interesting comments about the lack of queer women on Tinder was a huge finding of mine so far. Um, that if you look in the women who like women section, it's mainly um, women who are already have boyfriends and looking for threesomes or another person to join their couple. There's some straight women in there as well. And there is a lot of men in the women section as well, which we haven't determined whether that's a bug or whether men are just, you know, changing it around. So that's something that came up a lot. Yeah. Do you think that maybe one of the reasons that there aren't a lot of bisexual women active on Tinder is because it's so commonly represented through media as a straight device? Absolutely. It is very marketed towards straight people. But because there isn't really any apps for queer women, gay men have grinded, but they don't really have anything else. So they uh, have to go on Tinder to find other women. But yeah, they find it very hard and lots of queer women don't like it. Yes. If I could code, I would absolutely do that. But unfortunately, I can just pave the way for other people to do that. Yeah. What do you think about the future is what's in there? Is it going to grow in seriously or is it going playing strict on the voice? Well, I've heard that they're trying to make the app more transgender friendly and more open to queer people because it's quite binary right now. It's only for male and female and default to heterosexual, as I said. So by making it broader, they will accept a broad range of people. But as more apps for different types of, type of people emerge, I imagine that people who want specific things will go off there into the other apps as long as they're popular because they don't work unless they've got lots of people on them. So do you think that because there's one thing of Tinder being for and it's mainly heterosexual, mm -hmm. to have separate apps is um, what's the term for kind of like politically correct or is it about trying to get these apps to be more um, gender they have gender equality around them? I think that a lot of people find the issue with Tinder is that it's made by men, straight men. So by having apps that are catered to women, by women, or by queer women, would make it a lot more comfortable than them than having to fit themselves into Tinder. But we'll see whether Tinder accepts all the critique around it or whether yeah, people go off it. Yes, hi. Absolutely, there is definitely a risk. And like in the Olympics, how they found that there were men who wouldn't, hadn't come out yet who were using Grindr, and so they got outed because of that. So I think it's a balance that people who aren't out have to take, whether they want to use these um, queer-friendly sites or whether they want to be out or not. So yeah, there's certainly a balance. Mm -hmm. I mean, she has a good point, um, but would that continue to keep it a sort of like a marginal value thing? If you continue to separate that, you run into your normal deal then? Yeah, it is certainly possible. I think there's a lot of negotiation on yeah between the marginalised and the mainstream, so we'll just have to see how it plays out, I guess. No, no, they're very different things, yes. Grindr came, Grindr is just for gay men and it came out years before Tinder, yes. Okay, one, one more question. Yes. <laughs> to 
Oh. Yeah, go for it. I'm just interested to know if you have contact with people at Rainbow Youth and what they are doing and how you see where they need to go next. Um, I don't. I don't actually have much contact with people with Rainbow Youth. I do see them. I don't know how they are with bisexual people or people within that community, so I would need to explore that more to see whether they're friendly to all sorts of LGBTQ people, because I know that there is a lot of issue and conflict between bisexual people and the rest of the LGBTQ community, so you have to see whether you're going to be accepted or not. That would be good for you to share your research findings with Rainbow Youth. Absolutely, yeah. yes it would be. Yeah. Thank you everyone. Cool. Uh, thank you Tara, uh, on behalf of the University Postgraduate Center. I would like to thank you for sharing an overview of your research. Thank you. And we have a small token of appreciation for being present. Today. Awesome. Thank you, thank you very much. Oh, thank, you. Cool. thank you.